Well, hey everybody, this is Chris with The Ancient Scholar, and today what I'd like to do is I'd uh, like to spend a little bit of time talking about something that was actually requested, a uh, really, really good request, so I'm actually really happy and really excited to talk about this particular topic. So, this particular topic has to deal with a couple of different things, and this is from a, uh, a paramedic who works at uh, NASA. We actually have a um, subdivision of NASA just outside of um, Las Cruces, New Mexico, and uh, they they specialize. One of the things that they do at NASA is they they look at decommissioning old um, uh, pieces of equipment, aer aerospace equipment. And one of the substances they deal with is a substance known as as hydrazine, um, or specifically, I believe they deal with something known as monomethyl or monomethyl hydrazine, uh, or MMH. And how about I change that color to something a bit easier to see? I think that might be the way to go here. Let's find out. There we go. Okay, so monomethyl hydrazine. And hydrazine has... Just, just hydrazine, just make, looking at the generic structure of hydrogen, hydrazine, uh, chemically it involves uh, nitrogens covalently bound, and then hydrogens coming off of them, and, whoops, something kind of like that. All right, so that's the basic molecular structure of, of hydrazine, and you can modify that a little bit. Um, so there you go. So the specific uh, substance that, that uh, he was referring to is monomethyl hydrazine, and this is used in um, rocket fuel. All right, rocket uh, fuel. And in addition to that, it's used in um, satellites as a propellant. Um, and they can position themselves and whatnot. And so one of the things they do here there at NASA is they decommission these and they have to work with hydrazine. And of course, hydrazine is, is highly toxic. So when we talk about hydrazine, and, and, and I use that in a generic, generic sense because monomethyl hydrazine is typically, specifically what I'm talking about, but there are other types of uh, instances where uh, hydrazine-like molecules uh, come into play. For example, INH which is an anti-tubercular or an, uh, tuberculosis medication. And then a type of poisonous mushroom uh, belongs to the gyrometra uh, genus, I believe. Uh, the gyrometra uh, mushrooms, uh, I just remember them as being the brain mushrooms. They look kind of brain-like or the false morales also contain a hydrazine-like uh, compound. Um, so we will say brain. <laughs> I just remember them as the brain mushrooms. Uh, brain mushrooms they contain. Uh, so all of these things, uh, monomethyl hydrazine, INH, brain mushroom exposure, can have an acute syndrome that's associated with them. But in addition to some of the acute things that we run into, uh, hydrazine is, is highly carcinogenic as well, so there are some long-term things you got to worry about with hydrazine exposure um, in regards to uh, developing cancers and developing um, genetic damage as a result of uh, hydrazine exposure. But I'm going to talk about the acute, some of the acute things that happens there. Okay, so what happens? Well, Hydrazine interacts with some very important enzymes and some very important substances. So let's just talk about that real quick. So uh, the hydrazine interacts with an enzyme. All right, and this is an enzyme that's specifically in the central nervous system. Okay, it in interacts with this enzyme, and, and this enzyme is pyridoxine uh, phosphokinase. And so let me just draw, uh, put that name there. So pyridoxine pyridoxine phospho, phosphokinase phosphokinase. Pyridoxine phosphokinase. All right. And pyridoxine phosphokinase 
is an enzyme, and if you remember my videos on the GABA shunt, the GABA, the GABA shunt, all right, that's how we produce GABA, and remember that GABA is the primary inhibitory, it's the in primary inhibitory neurotransmitter of the central nervous system, and uh, glutamate, um, or glutamic acid is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. So um, this enzyme is very important in the GABA shunt. Specifically what pyridoxine uh, phosphokinase does is it converts the substance pyridoxine, all right, which is also sometimes known as vitamin B6, um, very important uh, in a uh, cofactor, very important cofactor for, for multiple enzymes and enzyme systems. This is just one of many that it's an important part of. Um, but pyridoxine phosphokinase um, helps catalyze the conversion of a pyridoxine to its active uh, form, which is pyridoxal 5' prime phosphate, or we'll just say PLP. Now, PLP is the active form, is the active metabolite, if you will, of pyridoxine. Uh, okay, so why is PLP important? Well, PLP is kind of important because PLP is a cofactor or coenzyme. All right, specifically, it is a coenzyme for an enzyme known as L glutamic. L-glutamic acid uh, decarboxylase. All right, so it cleaves a carboxyl group, helps cleave a carboxyl group off. Group off. Okay, so you can see this is a there's a lot going on here. But what what's so important about L-glutamic acid decarboxylase? What's so important about that enzyme? Well, that is the enzyme that catalyzes the reaction. Um, and the reaction is as follows. You have L-glutamic L-glutamic acid, and again, this is um, from the GABA shunt. L-glutamic acid gets converted to GABA, gamma amino butyric acid. Okay, so let's just kind of run through this here. So you have some sort of exposure or some sort of toxicity or poisoning in a response to hydrazine or a hydrazine-like substance like INH or the brain mushrooms. All right, so you get that. Okay, so what happens? Um, the hydrazine okay, comes in and it prevents the conversion of pyridoxine to its active form PLP. Um, because you don't have this PLP, the PLP is not available to act as a coenzyme for the enzyme L-glutamic acid decarboxylase. So L-glutamic acid decarboxylase cannot catalyze the conversion of L-glutamic acid to GABA. So the ultimate effect is a decrease in the level of gamma immunobutyric acid in the central nervous system. So what does this mean? Well, this means that you have an imbalance. Okay, You have an imbalance where I have decreased levels of GABA, all right, and I have an increase or a relative increase level of uh, glutamate. All right, of glutamate. Okay, so I have an increased level of excitation, all right, and I have decreased levels of the neurotransmitter that keeps that in check. So what does that mean? It means I have overstimulation in the central nervous system, and that means that um, I'm my big. The big consequence of that is a seizure. All right, big consequence of that is a seizure. Now, this is important to know because generally, particularly in pre-hospital care, because this is a paramedic who asked me this question, how do we treat seizures in the pre-hospital environment? Well, we treat seizures with benzo, 
benzodiazepines such as um, Valium or Diazepam. All right, uh, we can use Ativan or Lorazepam or Versed, Midazolam. I don't think you really find reverse set anymore in the U.S. It's all all gone generic. Okay, so you, you treat these with benzos. Well, what do benzos do? Well, benzos work, okay, on the GABA receptor. Um, they do not bind to the receptor, though. This is the important thing about benzos. They bind through an allo, okay, an al allosteric site. Okay, they bind at an allosteric site, so they are not ligands okay, for the GABA receptor. So they cannot open the GABA receptor, and they cannot cause the chloride to flow in and um, suppress central nervous system activity. They help make the GABA receptor more responsive to the GABA neurotransmitter. Okay, they modulate the response to GABA, but they do not act as direct ligands. Well, that's a bum deal because here's the problem. If you have somebody that's overdosed on, the, on, on one of these things here, they don't have the GABA. So the benzodiazepines are not going to be particularly effective. Um, you might consider something like a barbiturate. Okay, a barbiturate, like phenobarbital or luminol. Um, and given at high enough doses, you can actually have uh, barbiturates bind to the active site, but then you have all the other problems associated with real high doses of barbiturates. So this is a clinical conundrum for us. Somebody gets exposed at NASA if there's a leak, okay, and, and, and perhaps somebody generally they, they wear, um, they're wear fully encapsulated protective uh, clothing, um, to protect themselves, but certainly exposure is possible. If they get exposed to this stuff, and you're a paramedic and you're responding and they're seizing, and you know your your first instinct is to give benzodiazepines because that's what you're taught. Benzodiazepines aren't working. What in the hell can we do to to treat this patient to get their seizures under control? To you know, obviously they're going to have altered mental status and and whatnot, and they may have some hemodynamic instability as well. Um, so what can we do? Well, what we found is we can actually administer, we find if we just administer pyridoxine, okay, if we give them pyridoxine, all right, um, we can actually reverse the seizures and, 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 and cause their level, their mental status to improve. They may even wake up. Um, how does this work? Because the mechanism of toxicity involves preventing the conversion of pyridoxine to PLP. I am not clear on the exact mechanism of what's going on here. Um, I, I, my suspicion is that by increasing the level of pyridoxine, um, I, my, my suspicion is that you probably shift the chemical reaction out of equilibrium and you favor a right shift and you favor conversion of PLP um, even though pyridoxine phosphokinase is, is inhibited. Um, it, it may just simply be favoring uh, the chemical reaction or maybe uh, something to do with the law of mass action. Um, that would be my best guess on the mechanism. I'm not as clear on the exact mechanism of of why giving this works because it doesn't really address the fact that the pyridoxine phosphokinase enzyme is um, inhibited. Um, another thing is that a hydrazine can actually directly inhibit whatever, what PLP you already have produced. So maybe administering pyridoxine um, interacts in that in some way, but mechanistically, I'm not exactly sure there, uh, but what we do know is that it, it certainly appears to cause market improvement um, of our patients, and then uh, how do we give the dose? I don't know about you guys at NASA. You probably have a protocol, but um, there are a few different ways of doing it. The, the common thing that I've seen is just to give a gram 
per gram um, administration of this. So let's say that you had like a one gram ingestion of INH, for example, you know, a little kid gets into it, um, then you would give one gram of pyridoxine. Uh, um, now, when it comes to inhalation, like hydrazine, you know, out there at NASA and some sort of inhalation or you know, so there's a leak and it gets all over somebody, I, I would say that you're probably going to look, and again, you probably have protocols, but I'm going to say you're probably going to look at titrating the pyridoxine to response. You know, you're going to give a gram and you're just going to continue administering the pyridoxine until you see some sort of improvement in your patient stabilizes. That would be my that would be the intuition that I go off of. But with that in mind, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And for the uh, person, the gentleman that requested this video, I hope that this addressed the questions that you had about this uh, from a mechanistic standpoint. Sorry, I couldn't answer everything as detailed as I'd like to, um, but hopefully I've provide, provided you with enough detail that you can really sink your teeth into it and understand it a little better. Um, just let me know in the comments if I need to uh, focus on something or if there's a, another direction that, that perhaps you wanted me to go with this video, and I can always do a follow-up or revision if needed. All right, as always, thanks for hanging in there, guys.